Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to another episode of Sri's daily global COVID-19 show. My name is Sri Srinivasan, and it's my honor to host this daily conversation around all aspects of the COVID-19 crisis. We talk about health, financial issues, and racial inequality. We're always looking for guests and theme suggestions, so please email me, sri at sri.net. We're live on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, and on LinkedIn. Please find me and please share this very important conversation. It's episode number 146. We've been live for 146 days, and this is our topic tonight, Native America under COVID. We'll be talking about all aspects of the crisis with Brett Chapman, who's on Twitter, at Brett A. Chapman, please follow him, is an attorney in Oklahoma, an expert on self-determination. He's of Ponca, Pawnee, and Kiowa heritage. His ancestors were involved in a landmark civil rights ruling, which helped end America's forced Indian removal policy. That's what it was called. We are going to ask him questions. He's gonna share his knowledge, and we're all going to learn together. You'll meet him in just a couple of minutes. Hi, everyone. I'm Sri Srinivasan, and thank you for being with us. I'm the Marshall Loeb Visiting Professor of Digital Innovation at Stony Brook School of Journalism. I'm also the co-founder of DigiMentors, a social, digital, and virtual events consulting company. Our motto, don't cancel your event without talking to us. Don't plan your virtual event without talking to us. My email address is right here. We work with small organizations and large organizations. We've done events for 50 people and for 100,000 people. And we were happy, we'll be very happy to work with you. Please contact us. Even if we just have a question about virtual events, please email me, we'd love to chat. The only reason we're able to do this show is because of the incredible support of our two producers, Rose Horowitz, who's at Rose Horowitz 31, and Vandana underscore Menon, Vandana Menon. Please follow them. They've been with us for 146 days. In the first 140 days, we've had a million viewers, 100 million social impressions, 260 guests, 148 of them women. We want to up that ratio. Guests from 53 cities and 15 countries, including the chief scientist of WHO. We are in partnership with Scroll.in, one of India's leading news, information, and culture websites. And you can find all our archives at youtube.com slash Srinet, youtube.com slash Srinet. Before we start, we want to thank our sponsors, Muckrack Academies, Fundamentals of Social Media, a free certification now available, mrac.co slash social, mrac.co slash social. More than 4,000 people have signed up for this class. I learned a lot, and so will you. We want to thank our other sponsors, including nonbelievable.com, divinely delicious cookies on a mission. Each box of handcrafted cookies purchased provides two meals to those in need. 20% off with the code SRE, S-R-E-E. -E. Nonbelievable.com, divinely delicious cookies on a mission. One way you can support people in need and support this show is just go to nonbelievable.com, create an account, buy a few cookies. Why not? Thank you so much for considering that. We also want to thank the folks who are part of our other shows that we put on, including She's On Call. This is Sundays at 11 a.m. Eastern. You can find the archives at She's On Call on Facebook and Twitter. Dr. Sojana Kurian and Dr. Marina Chand uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar and Marina Kurian, my good friends and uh, who are two surgeons themselves, have fabulous guests. This week they had Dr. Ben Chang and Dr. Claudette Dijam. Please go back and look at this terrific content, especially an, around COVID and what happens with schools. And we also want to tell you about one of the shows we're producing that we're so excited about. It's Little Steven's Roadshow, co-hosted by Drew Carey. You know Stevie Van Zant from the E Street Band, The Sopranos, and my favorite Netflix original, Lilyhammer. And of course, you know Drew Carey from everywhere on TV. And wow, two weeks ago, we were in Cleveland virtually, and this week we're in Detroit. The guest lineup, Alice Cooper, Wayne Kramer, Martha Reeves, Nick Speed, and so many other people. You don't want to miss this show. Just go to teachrock.org slash roadshow. 
teachrock.org slash roadshow and sign up for this. It's uh, this coming Thursday, August 6th at 8 p.m. Eastern. You don't want to miss it. And now we're ready for our conversation around Native America under COVID. We are pleased and honored to bring to you a conversation with Brett Chapman, an attorney in Oklahoma, an expert on self-determination. Uh, his ancestors were involved in a landmark civil rights ruling, which helped end America's forced Indian removal policy, as it's called. Before I bring Brett on, I just want to say one thing that I am so sorry and so embarrassed that in 146 episodes, we did not address the issue of Native Americans under COVID-19. We've been on the air for 146 days. We touched upon it on a couple of episodes. Sapphire, the writer whose novel Push became the movie Precious, the Oscar winning movie Precious, she said something that has struck with me and stuck with me. She said that if we keep saying, wash your hands, we keep saying, but there are Native American uh, communities where there is no running water. And what are we talking about? Wash your hands. It was so, so important for her to raise that issue. And we've touched upon Native American issues a little bit here and there, but nothing like this. And I take responsibility for that. We're making amends for doing that so far. And we hope we can do many more discussions of this topic. As always, please send us your suggestions and your questions right now. Let me bring on Brett Chapman. Hi, Brett. Hi, how are you? Thank you so much for being here. My first question always, how are you? How's your family? How are you doing through this crisis? Doing well, you know, just trying to do the best we can, staying away from it and, you know, living our lives. And uh, tell us where you are. You're in Oklahoma, right? Yeah, in Tulsa. And uh, Tulsa, of course, was in the news for a variety of reasons, mostly around this huge rally that President Trump tried to have in Tulsa on Juneteenth, and then it was moved by a day, and then he was arguing whether how many people were in the crowd instead of asking why he held the largest indoor gathering of Americans since the crisis started. And all of that went down just in the last couple of days. Uh, what is the situation in Oklahoma today? If you know any of the stats, is it going up, down, et cetera? Yeah, it's definitely going up here in Oklahoma, so it's not a good thing. And I think that it, it could be tied to that, uh, tied to that rally. So absolutely, it is going up. So it's a dangerous thing. Yeah, and that's certainly an issue. So uh, thank you for being here. When when we talked on Twitter and you were kind enough to spend some time with me, I, I said that I'm sorry that we've not approached this topic before. And it's very hard to say to one Native American, mm -hmm. now teach me everything, right? We uh, when when the uh, protest protest started after uh, the uh, after the George Floyd killings, we we talked about this with one of our friends, Sunny Slaughter, a businesswoman and activist, and she said, "Don't ask your black friends what can you do now. Ask them what have you been doing all this time before." Mm -hmm. And I will say, if we ask that same question about Native Americans, I have failed. I uh, come from a community, the Indian American community and the Indian community in India, where there is almost no understanding of Indian American, of American Indians or Native Americans, as they are called. Uh, when we were growing up in India and elsewhere, the word we used, red Indian, we didn't know it was a slur. We thought that, you know, we're Indian and they're red Indian, and right. that's probably what Native people like to be called. We had no idea. It was not meant as a pejorative but that's no excuse. And then you come to this country and you learn a little bit about Native Americans and all. I grew, came here at nine, so I knew a little bit, but you can live in Manhattan as I do today and not encounter a single Native American or any Native American causes, any Native American insignia, any Native American organizations, and it is such a shame. So again, I say what I'm asking you is a little unfair to uh, make up for all that in one night in a one hour call. But if you don't mind, um, if you could just first reflect on all of that first, and then I'll ask you some questions. Yeah, sure. I mean, what I would say to that is, you know, don't be too hard on yourselves. I mean, uh, nobody in America knows about Native Americans. That's, you know, really, in my opinion, the biggest problem facing Native Americans is one of invisibility, which you have discussed. Um, you know, people just don't think about us in the course of their daily lives. 
Um, any depictions of us, this is why the mascot thing is important, any depictions of us are stereotypical or uh, some type of racist caricature from the past. Uh, and so a lot of people don't see Native Americans as a living, breathing people today. And, you know, as you mentioned, uh, the population centers like on the East Coast, uh, you know, if you look back to history, there's a reason why there's no Native Americans there during colonialism. And then after colonialism or after the United States, Indian removal. That's why we live in communities overwhelmingly um, isolated in the West, although there are a lot of urban Native Americans just on their own. Um, as a whole, we tend to live in communities out West. So. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, I think every Native American probably is used to being what I would term as the only Indian in the room. Um, you know, you're having to say these things all the time, but that's part of it. I think good thing about today is that people are slowly wanting to learn. So, I mean, that's a great deal. There is a reckoning that's happening, and I'm, I'm glad it is. It is focused, as you know, on African-American issues. How do we guide the attention to Native American issues without, you know, saying, our story is more tragic or worse or different from the African-American issue that's happening, that's being, that has caught fire, so to speak, right now? Well, I don't think you really try to, you know, take any attention away from the African-American issue because that's a very important issue and they are working hard on that. I think what the real ultimate goal here is not to, you know, try to jump in on it, but to create a wave. Um, you know, you're creating this uh, change in society where people are looking at things differently. You know, they're starting to, change their perspective on things uh, like with these statues and it'll ultimately trickle down to Native Americans. I, I'm confident it will. You know, looking at the past, the uh, Civil Rights Act or the Civil Rights Movement back in the 50s and 60s, you know, that most people probably don't know, but on the heels of it at the end in the early 70s was a uh, significant movement for Native American rights. So, I mean, I'm confident that it's going to be on the tail end of that. So, you know, I think it's a great thing in some of these uh, these wins that we've been seeing, like the uh, Washington Redskins and some of the statues, I think that's directly tied to George Floyd and Black Lives Matter. I mean, that's a very powerful group, uh, powerful people using their voices, and it's a great thing to see, and you just hope that that continues. We have in journalism a Native American Journalists Association, just like we have South Asian and, and others, and uh, we used to, you know, when people ask me, do you have a uh, a representative of you know, Native American journalists in in New York, and for a while there was one gentleman named Derek Henry, and we, you know, I'm sure he was tired of being the only Native in the room, as you say. But how do you get through that, especially as you, you know, you live, I presume, in the urban uh, part of Tur Tulsa, or at least suburban part of Tulsa. So talk about that a little bit. And are people surprised to hear you're Native? How does that come up? Uh, you know, what is the issue of a uh, kind of uh, passing? Uh, how does that all fit in, if you wouldn't mind? Well, yeah, I mean, I think as far as like talking about it, I think that's just kind of a way of life. I think that's just something that everyone accepts when you're Native American, that people are interested and curious about it and you know, also ignorant about it. And that's not a reflection on the person. That's more of a reflection on society. You know, what, what comes out of our education system, we're not even included in history books uh, anymore. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, we're used to that. I think that that's a common thing. But, you know, as so far as you're talking about kind of a racial identity, I think what most people, you know, to start at the top of Native Americans is, um, you know, race was not a known concept uh, to my ancestors, let's say in 1492, 1491. They had no idea what that was. Um, you know, race is a foreign concept introduced by the Europeans. And so that's that's something that has been used to define Native Americans. But I think um, people also might in the back of their heads know that treaties are involved. Um, and so what really defines Native Americans is that sovereignty. You know, you don't cut treaties between, uh, you know, the United States doesn't go sign treaties with some ethnic group off in, you know, in China or something. They sign it within the sovereign government. And so the way that the Europeans did when they colonized here, they recognized Native American tribes as nations um, and they uh, entered into international relations with them. And so, um, you know, a lot of these tribes um, still exist. And so, that's what really defines Native Americans. So just as much as I couldn't tell your nationality just by looking at you, I couldn't tell if you were American or anything. You know, it's the same with Native Americans. You can't just look at one and tell. And so, you know, this day and age, there can be black people that are Native American. There can be white people that are Native American. There can be people that are brown that are Native American. There could be Indians that are Native American. It could be anybody, you know, it's just that you have to have that ancestry and recognition by a tribe or a sovereign nation. And so, yeah, it's just these days, I, you know, personally, I don't really put too much into how someone looks in determining whether they're Native American, because that's, that's not my call to make. 
I hear you. Thank you so much. One of the things we do is we have comments from people around the world. They'll be reacting to this. So I'm going to read you some of those. And by the way, if you've been to any of these places, please say, tell us if you right. have. Tallahassee, Florida, have you been? I have not been there, no. All right. Uh, Paula Kiger is uh, someone on my DigiMentors team and is an awesome editor and writer, and she's in Tallahassee. We're also joined by Jonathan Borstein from the East Village in New York. Have you been to been East there. Village? Yeah. You, sorry, you, you have. All right. Good. And uh, and uh, uh, let's see. Apollo's watching from Vegas. Do you have a story of Vegas you're allowed to share on, in front of everybody? Yeah. Well, I think the last time we were there, my wife and I had a very, very brief layover there. So it was kind of accidental, but we, uh, we had a lot of fun there. So. Okay, good. So you're being uh, somewhat circumspect. That's okay. Really <laughs> <laughs> Apollo says, what does it mean that half of Oklahoma has been declared a reservation because Congress didn't dissolve it? My family came through Oklahoma and my native blood is written on my face, he says. Yeah, well, what that means is, um, you know, that's going back to this sovereignty aspect. And part of sovereignty is autonomy um, that, you know, what they sign these treaties for a lot of times in the beginning is that these uh, native nations had the right to conduct their own affairs. They had a right to punish their own criminals and things of that nature. And so when you think of this, that these reservations have never been disestablished, it's just a question of jurisdiction. And so these tribal governments like the Muscogee Creek Nation, you know, they're co-equal with uh, any municipal, state or federal government in this regard. And so there are there are statutes um, with regard to this that they're still figuring out right now um, um, is how far, how what the breadth of it is. But um, yeah, so I think with the uh, McGirt decision, you know, you're going to see a lot more prosecutions in tribal court uh, for Indian offenders or people that are Indian that are accused. Um, but I think otherwise, it's not really going to affect the average Oklahoman. Um, you know, it's definitely not going to lead to, uh, you know, just opening the doors on the prison system and letting people out, um, as the uh, state government is trying to say. So. so there are people opposed to this and are saying things like that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the, the, there's a lot of interest in it. So one would be the state government interest. You know, they're very anti, uh, at least the Republican governor we have now is not very friendly to Native Americans in several regards. But um, you also see a lot with Native Americans, since it's land-based, you have a lot of oil and gas and interests like that. So you're gonna see a lot of special interests in there like this. And sure, I hear you. Uh, Suda uh, is watching from Hastings on Hudson and Azad says good. And Mark Lee is watching from Durham, North Carolina. Have you been? Uh, I've been to Durham, yes. Okay, uh, she says, uh, he says he has many family members are Haliwas, is that the right pronunciation? Or do you, you're, I'm not. I'm not sure. I haven't heard of that one. I don't know. I might. So, my, so there are so many tribes that even someone well versed in there's many. Five hundred and seventy-three. So uh, federal oh, recognition okay. ones. And there's even there's even more that don't have federal recognition. So yeah, there's there's a bunch. Well, Mark says my a good friend of mine, John Scott, is a Native American actor in New York, and he says Alyssa Hinton is a Native artist. There's a good way for us to learn some names. Apollo says, "Thank God they finally retired the redskin name. The racism." Plus, I spoke to a man that lived on in Indian Massacre Lane in Virginia and, and was astonished they never changed it. How are there places with names like that still? I mean, the red, the Redskin story is one thing, but Indian Massacre Lane. Well, when you look at it, I mean, most people, when they think of um, imperialism, when they hear American imperialism, they think of tropical islands far away, you know, the, like 1990, or 1890s, early 1900s, Teddy Roosevelt, things like that. But it started way before then, you know, you know, they started just a bare spot on the East Coast and they just slowly moved their way west, you know, and that's what this whole um, Wild West uh, mentality of like winning the West, taming the wilderness and that type of deal. Um, the way that they justified stealing the land, um, they would say um, that there's a very small Native American population and that basically the land was uncultivated wilderness that they were just taking and fixing up. Um, that was theirs. And so they see these things, at least historically, they saw these as victories. Um, you know, an Indian mass claim might be that's just a part of a local history, you know, and they probably got them back. You know, that's a, uh, Amazing. a common thing. You know, it's, um, there's so many things like that, that, you know, you just look at and it's like, man. Apollo says Native Americans are sovereign, yes. Uh, Rich is saying hello from Santa Cruz, California. Have you spent time in California? Yeah, I have, yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Jonathan says, New York City has one of the largest Native American communities in the country. An, Amer an American Indian community house used to be a few blocks away from where I live. So Jonathan and I live both, both of us live here. And 
you don't i what i'm saying is they may be here but they're not visible and that's that's oh, sure. yeah i think that there's yeah absolutely there's native americans that live in new york city los angeles but you know the the life there it's a uh, it's not really Native American in a way. I mean, it's just, it's a real mix of people and you know, it's a very fast paced deal. So, I mean, yeah, I don't think that people probably put much stock into what really anyone looks like. And, you know, if I think of like New Yorkers, I think they just kind of go about their day, right? And doing their own thing, so. They're just busy like everybody else, yeah. past you like everybody else, wearing yeah. earbuds like everybody else and not listening to you, not chatting with you, not yeah. looking in the eye that's what we say in new york don't do that mark says in my thoughts it was great hearing alliances between russell means and the aim and black power movement in history uh, so again lots of people from countries that have never heard the name russell means never heard of the aim do you mind giving us a quick history sketch please yeah absolutely that's what i was talking about um after the civil rights movement so you saw this uh this beginning of an american indian movement and so you know they um they got their point across for sure. Um, you know, the Wounded Knee occupation, that was followed by uh, several legislative victories. So, um, you know, they knew how to get in the news cycle and that they overcome that invisibility aspect to get something done. So, I mean, I think they did a lot of good things for uh, Native American nations. Thank you. Let's see who else is here. It says there are tribes that are not always recognized. Haliwa and Lum Lumbee had to fight for recognition. Doug Levy is watching from Northern California. Thanks for shining the light on such a sh an important and underappreciated issue. Have you spent time in San Francisco? Yeah, I have. I like, I like San Francisco, yeah. It's nice oh, place. yeah, cool. And Deepak uh, is watching from India and says, sorry, I don't have time right now, but I'll catch it later. That's great. You can always catch up. And uh, Twyla says, Smithsonian's Museum uh, uh, for American Indian Native American uh, issues is in Bowling Green. Have you seen that at the bottom of New York City, uh, at the bottom of Manhattan, there is a uh, old customs house that have been changed into a museum for Native Americans. And uh, that's also what Suda is talking about right now. And uh, go ahead. Yeah, I've, I've seen that, you know, um, I think with museums, um, you know, speaking of New York, we went to the Met a couple of years ago and, uh, you know, purposely was asking around, you know, where's the Native American stuff? Where's the Native American stuff? You know, because it's America's largest art museum. And of course, you're walking through the uh, pyramid and the uh, colonial makeshift colonial house. And it's just a little corner in the back. But even since that time, uh, they've upgraded that. And so there's evidently more of a display there. So that's a great thing. As uh, I was the chief digital officer at the Met for three years, and uh, I know it became a priority, but we would never do enough, right? Like no one can do enough is, the, is, is part of the issue as we look at this. Uh, Daryl says, to be clear, Christopher Columbus was lost when America rescued him and his men. He didn't discover shit. <laughs> uh, time to end Columbus Day and bring down all the statues. No more. Columbus. So talk about Columbus, please. Yeah, again, what I, in my personal opinion, you know, it does deal with that invisibility aspect, you know, that there's this way that history is taught. It's very whitewashed, you know, and American history is not always just the way history went, you know, there's some nationalism to it as well. And unfortunately, with the uh, glorification of Christopher Columbus, there's a racial aspect to that. And that racial aspect is European colonialism, you know, even though this country is clearly founded by Anglo-Saxon people, you know, you see Columbus everywhere. If you ever look at the United States Capitol, just above the main door is like this whole thing to Columbus. Um, and inside the rotunda is just a complete worship of the man. Um, you know, and that's because they're seeing not, you know, that this is a, you know, a national thing in the United States, you know, in, in, throughout course, the course of history, you know, Spain and England were opposed to one another, they were rivals, but you see this glorification of what used to be an enemy country but you know it has nothing to do with that it has everything to do with race and them and what was white people coming and, col and colonizing this country and so you know it's a real what these columbus statues is important to show is this uh alternative take which is in my estimation the real take you know not a glorification of this man as a quote-unquote explorer you know as i always say an explorer is like neil armstrong you know neil armstrong went to the moon and nobody died but you know uh with Columbus, you know, he was the first one to bring back slaves across the uh, Atlantic Ocean, brought them back uh, over to the, over to Spain. And so, I mean, he did a lot of horrible things, you know, and it's uh, it deserves to be known. And he, and he also came up with the idea for colonization itself. So. So is your, um, it, you know, again, you, you're not speaking for all Native Americans, obviously, but in your personal take and the organizations you're associated with, it, do you call for dropping Columbus Day, dropping Columbus himself, uh, canceling him? 
removing a statue from Columbus Circle in New York, Columbia University, all of those things? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say all of them, but I mean, I think definitely, you know, with regard to the statues in the day, sure. I mean, I think one way to create visibility, I mean, as everyone can tell, this is going to become an overarching theme of Native Americans is just the invisibility aspect. And so one way to overcome that, there's very few holidays that are federal holidays where nobody has to go to work or very few have to go to work. And so, you know, to change Columbus Day and make Indigenous Peoples Day or Native American, whatever they want to call it, as long as it's not that, but it honors Native Americans you know, a federal holiday to remind people that it's not just like Thanksgiving where they're thinking back to, you know, Squanto and the Pilgrims, that we're still here. You know, you're celebrating indigenous peoples of the year 2020 and not, you know, thinking back to, you know, 1492 of what happened to the people, you know, that, you know, like that he in encountered. So, yeah, I'm definitely in favor of changing the names of the holidays. I'm definitely in favor of uh, removing the statues. You know, the naming issue, I mean, Columbia, I mean, I never really thought about some of that stuff because, I mean, you know, like the District of Columbia is just so widespread on the naming stuff. Yeah. But, you know, I think a lot of it is at least the start is removing the statues themselves because, you know, they glorify it. As I mentioned in the United States Capitol, I would implore everybody to look that up. I mean, he is all over that place and it is there to glorify the colonization and conquest of the Americas. Uh, let's see, uh, so many questions and comments coming in. Folks, please write in and talk to Mar Brett. He's so kind to uh, be, be open and take your questions. Mark says, would love to hear our guests talk about the, I'm, I'm even embarrassed to say this, the powwow community. Uh, also, there's a great Native American museum in DC. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the powwow community, I mean, it's just a very close knit among people of many tribes, especially here in Oklahoma. Um, you know, and it's kind of difficult now with the uh, coronavirus that there's uh, a lot, not many powwows as usual. But um, yeah, I mean, it's just a time for Native Americans to get together and have a ton of fellowship. And, uh, you know, it's, a, it's something a lot of people participate in. I mean, I don't, I personally don't dance or do any of that, but I go to them. I mean, it's a way, you know, they're like family reunions in a way. So yeah, it's a great thing. All right. Um, Meher asks a question. I, I know you're not a <laughs> political pollster, but what is the chance of Trump re-election? What is the voting record of Native Americans in the past? How much, what percentage of them vote, if you know, if you happen to know, and then did people vote for Donald Trump at all? Well, I think, you know, I don't I don't know if he's going to be reelected or not. I would probably caution based on the last time. You know, I think a lot of these poll numbers we're seeing are very similar, you know, like 49 to 37%. So, I mean, I think people should be cautioned. But, you know, insofar as Native Americans, um, you know, Native Americans aren't a monolith. I mean, there's a diversity, a wide diversity of opinions. Um, there's plenty of uh, Republican Demo or Republican Native Americans, but I would say that on the whole, there is probably more Democrat Native Americans. Um, you know, especially um, in regions where you see large concentrations, you can usually look on a map of the, uh, like in North Dakota and South Dakota, you can pick out little counties of blues. Well, those are the uh, reservations there in those uh, states. So yeah, I think uh, most are Democrats. Uh, let's see here. Lots of comments coming in. My mom is watching from Kerala in India. And I say, hi, mom. Love you. Thank you for always supporting me. I'm so grateful. Uh, have you been to India? I have never been to India. I'd love to go there, though. All right. We've got to get you to uh, get you to India. Rick says, in 1493, Pope Alexander VI issued a papal decree that justified European Christian explorers' claims on land and waterways and promoted Christian domination and white superiority. Are you familiar with the source of religious con? colonialism and what's your take if you happen to yeah, it was all based in religion you know the doctrine of discovery is very racist in origin um and you know that's what the europeans have used and even the united states today uses to justify land claims um they all use that that basically that the uh superior race or superior nations of europe had a uh, title to lands that they claimed and native americans just had a right of occupancy and so, yeah, I think that that's, that's been something used to divest Native Americans and dispossess them of their land since day one. Um, and, you know, it's sad that it's still going on, too. You haven't really seen a repudiation, even of the Doctrine of Discovery, United States Supreme Court. So, and, and that's certainly one of the many issues we have to deal with. Apollo says, we have to talk about Columbus, make more opportunities to honor Native Americans. We're subsumed by American political identities. Raghavendra says, just sad to see all the injustice over the years on Native Americans. Thank you, Raghavendra. And Twyla says, how did the cultures of the tribes influence Oklahoma? Yeah, I think Oklahoma is a pretty unique state. And also New Mexico as well, There's in Arizona. There's a large Native American community there. And so I think a lot of uh, 
you know, the average Oklahoman is aware of Native American nations. And, uh, you know, I think the unique history is definitely a part of this state's background. Uh, unfortunately, the other part of it is like the land run and kind of the Westerns. But, um, yeah, I think that there is some influence here. Thank you uh, for sharing that. And uh, Mark says, uh, you must come to the Native American celebration in Raleigh, ir ironically held near Thanksgiving and with COVID, not sure it'll happen this year. And that's certainly gonna be an issue. Let's spend a minute on Thanksgiving, if you don't mind. Uh, the, under, the, 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 the storybook story or the textbook story is that uh, the Native Americans were invited over for a wonderful meal and they had a great time and there was much peace and celebration. Talk about the reality. Yeah, I mean, the reality of it is part of that, you know, that it could be true. Native Americans are very welcoming, hospitable people. You know, they may have welcomed them. But again, it's, it's a lot of it is there to justify uh, crimes and uh, dispossession of Native Americans. Um, and then provide a different way, you know, that, uh, you know, that the uh, Anglo-Saxons or the British uh, settlers treated them well. Um, you know, and that's just simply not the case. It kind of lays this uh, unrealistic uh, brush, it paints it with an unrealistic brush of what really happened under that. Uh, because, you know, ap before and after that, there's um, horrible attacks, uh, you know, and they're trying to play one another, play another tribe off of another for superiority. And so, yeah, there's a lot of bad things that happen. And uh, that's certainly one of the, so 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 in, in effect, Brett, what you're saying is that our very first story we hear as children about Native Americans is a, f a false story. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely not told, you know, the whole way around, for sure. Um, you know, I think that, you know, if they'd be truthful about it, it would be more open about more of the hostilities, because I think that that's really what what face Native Americans more than, you know, a meal or being nice every now and then, uh, because they did try to be nice. You know, they were very welcoming of uh, settlers and people that came in, but, you know, they wouldn't let you, they wouldn't get pushed around, you know, so they fought back. And here is a map that we're looking at uh, Native American reservations in the continental United States uh, without, you know, I'm just going to remove this banner so we can uh, see it. Uh, can you just walk us through a little bit just so people understand how did this happen that these were the places selected and what is the implication that it's all this far west? Uh, how did they, you know, as, as much as you can tell, again, for those of you joining, the idea was not to invite one Native American and then have him teach us everything, but uh, he is an expert on native self-determination and we'll talk more about him and his background and his uh, incredible uh, family history that I want you all to hear. But just for a moment, if you can focus on this, please. Yeah, so if you look at this map, uh, like in the Dakotas and kind of the upper Great Plains, that's where a lot of uh, native nations- oh, sorry, are. Just, sorry, one second, just so that people understand because we're, again, for a lot of people internationally watching, so the Dakotas are here, here right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so you look at the uh, top part of that, that's uh, the ancestral lands of a lot of those nations. They've just been severely curtailed. Uh, and that's just where they were set down uh, basically to be confined um, and kind of out of the way um, at that time. And especially like up in Montana and Idaho, same thing. Um, and then down there in New Mexico and Arizona, likewise, um, that's the, that is the ancestral territory of a lot of those nations. Now, what's not on this map if it would show it, is all of most of the tribes from the southeast there and also like in the Midwest by Ohio and in New York, those are the ones that are getting removed to Oklahoma. And so you see a bunch of tribes there. And so those are the ones that were subject to the Indian Removal Act. Um, and they get pushed over here and then also some in Michigan here. But, um, you know, some of these some of these nations and it's hard to point them out on this map, but have made numerous stops. You know, there's some of um, there's some uh, Delawares who have stopped in numerous places. They've been in several states. And so they just keep getting pushed, pushed and pushed. And that's really the story of American history is that all of these were just pushed west. And so when you look at these larger reservations as they are today, they're in areas that are not really inhabited. Well, I mean, they're inhabited, but they're not very populated, you know, like South Dakota, North Dakota, uh, Montana and stuff and Wyoming um, and also like New Mexico. So, you know, you just kind of see where that stops. And that's also where the, uh, you know, where basically what you would say is like the Indians were ended. And do you, do you have a sense that e even in that process, there was obviously a lot of pain and suffering and they were they told that this is for your own good and you're being moved? Is that sort of what happened? They will talk about the trail of tears in just a minute, but uh, 
were there any was there any hope that they were given or was it all forced and was there any sense of that maybe things could be better if we moved or it was all forced well you know i think when you look at it it's that you know when you sign a treaty under the pretenses and the, under the false pretenses that they had them sign a map um, especially those tribes in the southeast they didn't want to move but you know when you basically put a knife or a gun to somebody's back and then tell them to do it they're going to do it um you know that's they tried to say it's best for him. You know, Andrew Jackson, if you read history, he tries saying that numerous times. Um, you know, and what the reality is, a lot of these tribes get removed. Like uh, during the Civil War, the uh, Dakotas um, and the Winnebagos are one. And um, there was an uprising there in Minnesota during the Civil War. But um, these tribes, again, they get removed so many times after that. And they're just getting pushed from one place to another. Each one is just like land worse. It's like that land that really nobody would want. And they're telling them to cultivate it and it's uh something they can't cultivate and you know they're just throwing them there and so they're setting them up for failure you know because at the end of the day what the push was is that they would move native americans off but then you would have right behind them you would have white lands speculators people that are trying to make money off from future land acquisitions um, and people that think that they might be on a place like a, a mountain range or whatever that has uh, like the black hills you know that might have mineral resources and things of that nature so no matter what it was, they always found some excuse for them to go um, until it was just, you know, they're just left with next to nothing. And so there, I don't think that, you know, very rare is the circumstance, I think, that a tribe might say, yeah, we want to be removed because I think most of them were smart enough to know, you know, here's what's going on. So, so sad. Twyla says it's a wonder that any Native Americans survived. Yeah, after, really is. I do often think that. Yeah. After, after all, and there were people who would have been happy to uh, eradicate and remove all Native Americans. Raghavendra says, just so sad to see all the justice, injustice. Um, and uh, here, uh, uh, Twyla asks, do you know Wilma Mankiller and can you talk about her influence? Yeah, she had a lot of influence there, uh, you know, in the 80s when she came to power in the 90s and the Cherokee Nation there, especially here in Oklahoma. She's, uh, you know, it's kind of talking about that cultural impact. She's definitely well remembered here. Um, and, you know, she was a very powerful voice for, you know, not just the Cherokee Nation, but all the nations here in Oklahoma. And so, yeah, I think that she's very fondly remembered by uh, pretty much everybody here. And so there were uh, native native tribes that had female leaders before America had a female president. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And that's um, going back pretty far. I mean, I think the Kaw Nation, you know, they're probably not even the first, but I know they had one. Her name was Lucy Eads back in like 1924, 1928. So, I mean, it's it's gone back. And there's some tribes that also have a lot of, uh, you know, they're also inclusive of native or of, of women in the decision-making process too, unlike, you know, this Americans of that time. I went to several Native American preoccupations of Al Alcatraz on Thanksgiving years ago was enlightening. I think it still continues. I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar. Reoccupation of, uh, he's saying it's the reoccupation of Alcatraz by Native Americans. I don't know if you know that story. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of part and parcel with the American Indian movement. Um, you know, the occupation of a uh, wounded knee, and that's also something that went along with it as well. Um, so. Thank you. Raghavendra says, how much of an effort has gone towards reparation claims for Native Americans? Well, what I would say is that, you know, Native Americans, again, you know, one of the biggest injustices this country is the dispossession of Native American nations. And so a lot of these nations are still here. And so you don't want to buy them off with money. We're not asking for reparations. You know, you're asking for restoration of land where available um, and more autonomy and more sovereignty. And so I think the question is not so much about paying money. Uh, if you look at the case of the Black Hills, the Lakota Sioux, they're well known. Sitting Bull, um, their form of resistance, uh, you know, they fought the U.S. until the bitter end, um, you know, and unfortunately it didn't work out. But their land was clearly stolen under American, you know, even under American jurisprudence, clearly stolen. The United States Supreme Court even agrees. And so they said in 1980 that the uh, Lakota Sioux land was stolen and issued them, I can't remember the amount, Some it's in the billions though, is how much of the uh, money damages were. And they've never cashed that check because they don't want the money. You know, they want the Black Hills back. And that's, I think that's emblematic. You know, I think uh, that's a very, because land is wealth, you know, it's a, you know, one-time payment is, you know, maybe generational, you know, the people that get that payment might, that are the generation alive, but land is generational, it continues on. So I had not heard that story. Again, my ignorance and, it's on full display here, and uh, I, 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 w I promised myself to, to do more reading, so I did not know that. And we also learned, like, it was really the first time uh, when Trump went to 
Mount Rushmore that I understood that there is a whole um, uh, movement around doing away with Mount Rushmore. I bought into the idea that I must take my kids to see this amazing grand monument to America and freedom and this and that. And then yeah. turns out that it is considered a scar on the land. Can you talk about that, please? Yeah. So uh, the Lakota Sioux, again, um, you know, I think most people may have heard of Sitting Bull and um, you know, that in history, but the, they find the Black Hills to be sacred. Um, and they have been there for a long time now. And um, what happened was, is that's the exact land in 1875 that was stolen from them. Um, they found a prospector, I think an expedition found gold in there. And so at the time the United States was undergoing a, a severe depression. I think it was the uh, 1873, I think a uh, depression of 1873, but, or maybe been called the long depression, but they needed money to, uh, for their economy. And so, you know, every time that happens across history, where are they going? Native American, you know, they're going to for the resources and they thought there was gold in there. And so they opened that up and, uh, you know, just let them over in and they just outright stole it from them. And so, you know, on top of that, they, you know, threw Mount Rushmore on there. Yeah. See, again, I didn't know. And I consider myself somewhat well read and I did not know about this. And here's an article from PBS. If people search Native Americans and Mount Rushmore, the first thing, the creation of Mount Rushmore is a story of struggle into some desecration. The Black Hills are sacred to the Lakota Sioux. There's almost word for word, the original occupants of the area when white settlers arrived, et cetera, and for four presidents faces. So I can imagine how hurtful that is. If you believe that you, this is your land to have then these four gigantic faces kind of stuck on there. And it's not a marvel of engineering. It's not a marvel of uh, of art, it is desecration. Right, and what I would say is, I don't think it's that they believe it there, it's their land, it is. I mean, that's, um, you know, that's always that's always gonna be theirs, you know, and I think that, you know, they, they haven't gone anywhere, they'll never go anywhere, and I don't think that they'll ever stop trying to get it back, so, and I think one day they will, so. Thank you. Folks, you're listening to a wonderfully enlightening conversation with Brett Chapman. Please follow him on Twitter, Brett A. Chapman on Twitter. He's a lawyer. He's an expert on native self-determination, and he's here with us tonight. He's been very kind, very patient as I ask him somewhat ignorant questions mostly, and uh, all of you are asking questions as well. Please jump in. Please tell us where you're watching from, and please ask your questions. Uh, let's see. Rick says, uh, what are the best resources, books, et cetera, to educate white America and Indian American America about the injustices of racism against Native Americans. And thank you. Yeah, there's a book called The Indigenous uh, Indigenous People's History of the United States um, by Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. That's a good book. Um, Jeffrey Ostler, um, he's a good, he's at the University of Oregon. He writes well on it. Um, and really anything by any Native American author on it. Um, you know, if you're kind of going for the classic, bury my heart at Wounded Knee, I like that book. Um, it's a little bit dated now, but you know, it tells a, you know, it's probably the first one that tried to tell from a Native American perspective. I mean, it was kind of cheesy the way they tried to do it, but you know, it still tried um, to show that there's uh, two sides to this. And, you know, not only that there's two sides that, you know, one side is definitely more culpable. What are your thoughts on uh, movies uh, like Dances with Wolves? Yeah, I, yeah, that the movies like that, again, going back to the invisibility thing, you know, we're invisible in society today. The way people see Native Americans is through Hollywood, um, is through me media representations. And so in a movie like that, you know, they play heavily off from stereotype, uh, you know, historical accuracy is gone. Um, and so those things stick with people. And so all these movies about Native Americans, you've never named me a movie about a Native American or with a Native American actor. There's a lot of great ones too. Um, tell me a Native American actor that's been in a lead role of like a blockbuster film. I'll just sit here and wait. There's not been one. You know, tell me a movie about Native Americans living in 2020, you know, any time after 1900. There's not going to be one, you know, because the way this public perception is, is that it's just going to be cowboys and Indians. So we're stuck in the 1800s, you know, and it's in the movies that they make, they just never, you know, most of them are uh, playing off on that same stereotype. So it's, uh, it's, it's really annoying. It would be similar, I guess. You know, I guess if you're looking at, if you always thought that India was stuck in, you know, 1857, you know, the colonialism days and not, you know, where they are now, a modern nation with a ton of people. I mean, that's moving forward. So, I mean, that's really what's. Uh, and so are there filmmakers who are native who are trying to 
tell stories of like everyday people and oh, yeah, yeah there's definitely there's a lot of writers out there uh lucas brown eyes is a good one he's a tv writer i mean there's people out there trying to do it and they're talented too you know they're just not really given the way that the system is set up especially in hollywood you know um, it's not set up to you know reward these they're just looking for something else profit um, and things of that nature they're not really looking for you know native americans and they're not really looking for the native american story so I, I hear you. A lot of their casting decisions too are kind of questionable as well. I mean, I think you see a lot of films where somebody of questionable, because anyone can claim to be Native American, right? I mean, someone can just say, you know, well, you know, okay, well, I, you know, I know my last name is like uh, something, you know, like Lynn or something, you know, but uh, you know, well, way back down there, I had a Native American ancestor, and you see someone like that that's getting a role of a Native American, like a Native American woman, you're seeing someone like that get that role over someone who's an enrolled tribal member who's, you know, that that would be more of a fit. And, you know, you see it done on qualifications, like maybe that other actor's more pretty or something like that. So yeah, it's a real problem. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, one of the things you've already taught me is there are some words and names of places that are actually Native that I didn't even know Delaware, I could have thought were, right. but you said there were the Delawares, you said. You said that the Winnebago's, you use that word. Yeah, the, the Delaware's are called the Lenape, and I think the Winnebago's are called Ho-Chunk, but yeah. So those are words that we use in other contexts. The yeah. Dakotas, like South Dakota, North Dakota, that's a, the Dakotas are a people. Iowa, Iowa's, they're a people. So Kansas, the Kaw, right. they're a people. The Illini, right? The Illini are peoples as right. well. Or yeah. Yeah. So, so in, of all the people in the world, when these words are being used, these are actually about people rather than descriptions of other things. These are, you know, human oh, yeah. beings. When they look like that, they're, they're about the native nation who was dispossessed of that. You know, the Iowa's, for example, Iowa. You know, the Iowa tribe is here in Oklahoma. They got removed down here. They're just uh, down the street here. So, but, you know, you have that whole state of Iowa. They had to go so you could have all the, uh, you know, Iowa farm boys out there. So. Uh, really, really upsetting. Uh, so that says, during the pandemic time, women from Native American reservations stitched many masks and donated during the critical shortage of masks, that was a great service. Uh, and they're like Americans, right? Uh, like oh, all right. Yeah, they just know what people live in today. Wonderful that they did that. Um, uh, Twyla says, Wilma Mankiller and Gloria Steinem were very close. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and Seema says, when did America ever have a female right. president? Never, and uh, it won't for another four years. As, as we, right. yeah. Uh, Twyla says, Native Americans arrested at a higher rate because much as any people of color, and there's also very high problems with uh, inside reservations, right, in terms of uh, the addiction and other problems because there are not a lot of opportunities. Is that correct? That's what I've understood. Yeah, yeah, like economic opportunities. Again, now this goes back to sovereignty. So what people, what my point would be is that it's not a handout, you know, that Native Americans aren't just asking the government for money. You know, their, their forebears, the uh, people in their tribal nations before them, sold territory to the United States under the promise of health care forever, under the promise of shelter and security and education forever. And so these things are part and parcel of treaties, of executive order, act of Congress. So, I mean, and this is called the trust responsibility, the federal trust responsibility of Native American nations. And it's just something that, you know, when they don't fulfill it, they don't fund it. You see it's a violation, in my estimation, of civil rights because you see funding for other people's programs like this much higher. Um, and so on native reservations and native communities, especially you'll see like the Navajos, there's a infrastructure problem there. And that's when you mentioned coronavirus and washing your hands with water. Um, you know, I saw like in 1979 that there was something it said like 50% or 60% of the Navajo nation didn't have electricity and running water. Well, you look at it today and it's like 40. I mean, what kind of improvement is that over however many years? You know, and then that just goes to show you have these politicians on both sides that they do not prioritize it because, again, we're not visible in society today. You know, a, a politician is going to support what their electorate wants to support. So and that's why, you know, the electorate is just simply not Native American. Thank you. Raghavendra says land is generational. So true. Great leadership needs to take a stand. Twyla says Native Americans were pushed to arid lands, no resources, area where water had dried up. I actually know a lot about this subject. Thank you, Twyla. Good. You and I will talk a lot about it. Paulo says, it, yes, the 1873 Depression under Ulysses Grant, he didn't run or politically or was politically damaged due to scandals. Why has Trump uh, sensitized people to racism? I always thought America was land of opportunity. I've been there. There's a lot of positivity, but things changed the moment Trump arrived. And this is a you know, point that we can discuss 
that how much of this is all Trump's fault and how much of it is in the system and in the blood of America. Oh, yeah. I would definitely say it's systemic. I mean, it's not anything to do. Trump's nothing new. Um, you look at this country. I mean, you know, you'll see people talking about, you know, he wants to renovate the White House while people are losing their homes. People are losing their homes every day in this country for ever since it's been here. So, I mean, I think a lot of American exceptionalism, as a Native American, you look at it and you see American exceptionalism is nothing but a fairy tale. I mean, it's no different than Chinese exceptionalism or Indian exceptionalism or Greek exceptionalism. It's just a country. And so, you know, a country can be flawed. It can have flawed leaders. It can have flawed principles. You know, this country is supposed to stand for great things and it does, you know, and maybe we should try to get there. But you got to realize that so much of it was set up. You know, this was a white person's country, like it or not. It was a white person's country until not too long ago. Um, you know, like I said, my ancestor was the first Native American to win civil rights. And that was 15 years after the end of slavery. Um, you know, even then they couldn't integrate into American society until the 20s. And so you're looking at this and it's barely been 100 years. Um, and even then, it's still it's still solely geared until recently towards white people. So, I mean, you know, I think the country has to address that. There's definitely a moment of reckoning on that. You know, it's nothing against white people either. I mean, I think it's trying to live up to the creed of this country, you know, of equality. And so it's just something that needs to be addressed. Yeah, uh, Rick is asking again about those book titles. So what we'll do is at the end, I'll ask you to just go through them very quickly and we'll make sure we transcribe and share that. But what now I'd like to do right now is to show your Wikipedia page and talk a little bit about your family's amazing background. I know you're very proud of it. You are, as it says here, uh, American attorney, a direct lineal descendant of Chief White Eagle, uh, 1840 to 1914, and a public figure who has frequently interviewed and speaks on Native American civil rights and self-determination. Talk a little bit about your ancestors and these three tribes that you uh, have roots in. I, I wanna say that I only know of the, pawn, the name Pawnee from the show Parks and Recreation. And, and I, I feel like on that show, they try at least to make fun of the white people who uh, hurt the Native Americans. Mm -hmm. That's the idea, I think, in how they do it. So mm -hmm. that's how we justify watching the show. Uh, so I don't know if you've seen it or have thought on it, but please tell me about your family. Right. Well. So on my mom's side, uh, I'm Ponca, which is a, a small a small tribe. And the, our ancestral homeland is with people the North Dakota or the South Dakota, Nebraska border. Uh, if you look at that on a map, that's where we're from. Um, and so my great, great, great grandfather, his name was uh, White Eagle. And so the way that the Poncas worked, their system of government, that it was a one hereditary chief. And so he was the uh, absolute leader of them. And so his dad in 1865 signed a treaty with Abraham Lincoln just about a month before he was shot in Washington. And it guaranteed him these lands in perpetuity. And then at some point, I think in 1870, his father, his name was Iron Whip, uh, resigned his uh, leadership position to White Eagle and then turned to uh, January 1877, towards the end of the Grant administration. Um, they're trying to solve the problem again with the Lakota Sioux um, and the Black Hills that's nearby. They were uh, having an armed resistance against the United States. So they're trying to solve that problem. And their solution was to remove the Poncas uh, to Oklahoma or to the Indian Territory and then move the Lakota Sioux to where we were. And so they did this completely unilaterally. Um, they passed a law, but the law said um, that the uh, federal agent that came down had to acquire uh, basically my grandfather's consent. And so when he arrived, what this man said was, you know, the president sent me. He said, you guys got to up and move. And so my grandfather put out a copy of his treaty and said, no, nah, I don't think so. You know, I've got this. It says no. And so they were very resistant. And uh, this guy, um, this agent, his name was Edward Kimball. Um, basically uh, forced them down to go look. He, under false pretense, he said, well, if you just go look, I'll let you go look. You don't have to move there, but just go see if you like it. And so they're like, okay, it was no harm, no harm in looking. And so um, my grandfather and Standing Bear, who was the second chief, uh, the vice chief, his vice chief, um, and a couple others uh, go down there with him. And they go down there, they don't like it. And so they tell him they don't like it at this little town called Arkansas City in Southern Kansas. And uh, the guy basically says, OK, if you don't agree, then you guys can just walk home and die. Um, and so he leaves them and they walk all the way back uh, to Nebraska um, to their homeland. And when they get there, there he is. And in the meantime, this guy had lied to the Interior Department of the president that a consent had been obtained. And so um, he would proceeded when they got back to effectuate the removal. And so they walked them down here, marched them down here against their will um, at the gunpoint of the U.S. Army. And uh, 
it, at the end of the day, it killed about 33% of the tribe. And so they moved them down here to Oklahoma. And after all these casualties, the, as I mentioned, my grandfather's vice chief, his name was Standing Bear. And so he had on the walk down here, his son and his son, daughter and grandchild were all killed on the walk down here. And so he only had one son left. And in December of 1878, his last son died here in Oklahoma. And so basically he just said, I'm out of here. You know, I'm going back. I'm going to bury my son um, at our ancestral lands. And he just goes, quote unquote, off the reservation, goes home. And so the president uh, orders the army to apprehend him. And um, he makes it all the way back up there before the army catches him. And when they do, um, instead of coming back down here, which he thought would result in his death, uh, just due to the malarial conditions and um, general bad, you know, bad uh, atmosphere down here at the time, um, he walks into a federal courthouse in Omaha with a petition for writ of habeas corpus in his hand. And prior to him, uh, no Native American really was even allowed in a courtroom, let alone recognized as a person with civil rights under law, which he was the first. So, um, you know, it's a great deal. Um, it kind of shows the best and worst of America. And I think a lot of times when the story has been told, it's been told kind of as a white savior story. Um, you know, like, look, well, we gave the Indians their rights. You know, it's a great deal. But, you know, after it's over, it's still, they still took his land again. So, um, you know, he didn't win um, his rights, meant very little after he got them. And so, you know, but to still be part of that legacy, what happened was um, when he did that at the time, um, there was a, you know, many formal ab abolitionists. We're about 15 years after the Civil War now. So there's a lot of old abolitionists who are looking for a new cause. And what they see is this Native American issue. And so you have a lot of them like Wendell Phillips, um, they take on the Ponca's cause. And so it caused the national outrage because it was in complete violation of this treaty. I mean, no one denied that it was in violation of this treaty, but they did it anyways. And then they wouldn't let him go back. Um, and so it just really caused this uproar for reform. And uh, one of the end results was is that they ended the uh, forced removal policy, at least for Northern, Northern tribes and really against anyone's will to the Indian territory. Um, so, but again, it was just at the end, it was already over. I mean, so you think how long that is. And one thing I would impel people is that, you know, a lot of people have heard of the Indian Removal Act, they've heard of Andrew Jackson, but no one can tell you where it ends because it never really ends, even though this is at the very tail end of it. You know, it just kept going on. You know, they were removing tribes left and right. Abraham Lincoln, everyone thinks this guy's a god. Everyone thinks that he's some statesman, did it too, you know? And, and that's, that's part of the tragedy of all of this is that uh, Native Americans were badly treated by everyone. Is there any hero in this story who's not Native? Well, I mean, I think I think you'd see, I think I would say people are good and bad. I mean, I think with my ancestors, there were certainly white people that they liked. I think my when my grandfather, great, 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 great grandfather, Iron Whip, was the hereditary chief in 1847, the Mormons uh, with Brigham Young uh, were making, they were, you know, being persecuted by the United States government themselves. They were walking from Nauvoo to the Great Basin in Utah. And so they asked my grandfather, he actually invited them to winter with the Poncas and they loved them. They loved these Mormons. Um, you know, they were really good to my ancestors. And I'm sure that's because the Mormons were in a very weak position at that point and my ancestors were not. But, you know, they treated them well. So, I mean, I think you'll find instances of that um, where there is good. But even the Mormons, you know, I think once they got down there, they were uh, quite bad to the local Indians in the Great Basin. But there are some, I would say, I mean, I think it's very fleeting. Because what people see here is, is that so ingrained in America is this idea of progress, you know, like everything's progressing technology, we're just moving forward, you know, that's just the natural way of it. Um, you know, and it's, it just kind of overlooks us, you know, it's like, okay, well, you know, we're really known for landing on the moon, building the transcontinental railroad, it just, it just erases us in the process, you know, and so it's this progress narrative that really Native American history is so antithetical to the American myth as it exists today. So it's, it's just hard to find any, because at the end of the day, even the people that were good still were, you know, thinking that they had an inferior culture or, you know, that the only way that we could be living is that if we became quote unquote white like them. I mean, so, I mean, it's just, it's a complex deal. Uh, just a couple more minutes. Uh, it, let's talk about the sports names and sports mascots. Uh, I, I hope there are Seminoles in and around the you know the, uh, the Florida State University, where they named themselves after the Seminole uh, in, uh, na native uh, tribe there, and 
the native. Well, in that case, yeah, that's one of the ones. Um, so the Seminole Tribe of Florida and the and Florida State University actually have a partnership on that. I think maybe they have a memorandum of understanding in which the Seminole Tribe of Florida could revoke consent with regard to the mascot Seminole or the mascot Chief Osceola, who is actually a real person. Um, and also Florida State University, I believe, requires incoming freshmen to take a course in Native American or Seminole history. So that's one of the right ways to do it. And the University of Utah is the same with the uh, Southern Ute tribe, um, but very few are like that. You know, that's one way to go about it. I mean, I think you look at like the Chicago Blackhawks. Black Hawk was a real person. This was a real man um, and he led a war. And so he was a warrior and it was a, called Black Hawks War, but it was very important in that region. But, you know, they could work with the, his descendants are now in what's called the Sac and Fox Nation. You know, they could work with them, they don't, um, you know, and that's named after a person. And so that's a... So know, there was, a, 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 in my ignorance, there was a Black Hawk tribe or a man's name was Black Hawk? The leader. man's name was Black Hawk. That was the leader, a war chief of the, of the South. See, I had no idea. I thought there was a tribe called the Black Hawks and, uh, and, uh, and, and that's that. So uh, last, last topic that I would like to uh, just touch upon is um, where do we go from here? And what can we do? Well, I asked this of our African-American leaders we've had on the show. What can we do to be allies? How can we help? What can we do? What should we do? You'll give us a couple of books and movies to watch maybe, but also what can we, like the way people have been um, so in, so activated to do something about the African-Americans uh, yeah. and their, their struggle here, how do we get more people to be activated to do things for Native Americans? Well, what I would think is that, you know, as long as you're bringing awareness to us today and not not just awareness, but that we're not a race and that we're sovereign nations and that, it, you know, with anything Native American, it goes back to land. And so everything is just land, land, land. And so what, what's good for Native Americans is, you know, this restoration of land or, you know, jurisdiction over land. So if you look at the issues, it all has to do with that. And so you look at this wide swath of this country, you know, find out whose land, you know, you're on. And so these nations, so many of them are actually still here, you know, like a you could take, for example, you know, the Cherokees, like if you're in Georgia, North Carolina, you, you know, you're like, well, the Cherokees got removed a long time ago. Well, they're still here. You know, these nations are still here. And so look into them um, and just realize that these people exist, learn more about them. And really, you know, a beseech to learn history because no one, you know, we don't learn that in school in America. And there's just so much of it. Like, you know, I mentioned Black Hawk, uh, Sitting Bull. There's just such a great story. Um, there's so many great people. And, um, you know, it really is, Native American history is American history, so I would encourage people to read about Native American history. Raghavendra says, I can draw a parallel about the bait and switch in India by the British as well. Right. Paulo says, Brett is a prince, oh, yeah. this has to be understood. Uh, Twyla says, Seminole tribe gets some financial royalty, we're, we're guessing. Uh, I don't know if they get it from Florida State, but you know, they definitely got their own uh, casino, they've got their own casinos that I think the individual members do. But. My alma mater tried to change its name. We were the Warriors in school and hired a true Native American uh, from upstate Wisconsin as a mascot and taught history of the people. Eventually, they changed to the Golden Eagles. These are the, these are the uh, Marquette. Marquette, yeah. And the nations are still here, and so their bloodline heirs. Um, what can we learn from Canadians? And if I may, I'm going to say about this. I was in Canada where they did something stunning, where at the beginning of a regular conference, they said a land acknowledgement statement where they said, we are here in, you know, and acknowledge the fact that this is the land that belongs to uh, these particular tribes. And I had never heard that. I'm in Manhattan, which is the ultimate place the land was stolen and uh, taken away from Native Americans. And we don't do that here. Do you think that's a good idea? Do you think we should do that? Is that just a symbolic thing or is it uh, worth doing? It's worth doing. I think what really the danger is that it just becomes more like lip service, you know, like, okay, well, this is the land of the Kiowas, the Comanches, you're just kind of, you know, just listing them off and no one really thinks of them. Um, and so, you know, the danger is, is that just becomes kind of performative. But I mean, for Native Americans, United States, I mean, we don't even get land acknowledgments. So, I mean, I think anything is a start for sure. So I, I urge all of you to read about land acknowledgments and I'm going to certainly read more about them. And Brett, if I could ask you one more time, a few of those books, please. Uh, yeah, let's see. I like Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. That's a classic. Um, and then also Indigenous Peoples, uh, History of the United States. That's a really good one, too. So. Okay. And, uh, so, Roxanne Dunbar with these. Thank you very much. And I just want to say uh, in front of everyone, thank you so much for being here, Brett. Uh, thank you for 
uh, agreeing to spend your part of your Tuesday night and for enlightening us. And I hope I can come to you again for some more uh, experts and maybe you'll also join us again uh, because we would love to explore these and it's because our networks aren't strong enough that we have to rely on the few people we have in them and that's on us. So we'll do the hard work, but we are so grateful to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Folks, please follow Brett Chapman, Brett A. Chapman on Twitter. Uh, let's amplify his voice. Let's amplify the voices of the Native Americans. We are so grateful to Brett for being here and for being part of our family here uh, tonight, this community that we have built, 146 straight shows. I said I'm embarrassed that this is the first time we've had a show about Native Americans, but I promise you it won't be the last. We have several terrific programs coming up, episodes this week. Today's Tuesday. Yesterday we had an incredible show about fighting hate under COVID with Oren Siegel, who was our guest, and uh, he's with the ADL Center on Extremism. Jenny La Lazarus was my uh, co-host, uh, who's my colleague at DigiMentors. Please uh, check that our episode out. All our archives are on youtube.com slash 3net. As you can see, uh, I learned so much tomorrow. Uh, we're going to be joined by my uh, grad school classmate, Heather Cabot. And we're going to talk about uh, her book, which is launching uh, this week. And it's called The New Chardonnay and what can we learn about marijuana and how the tide has turned on marijuana in this country. We'll talk about the, the, the success of the industry, but we'll also talk about the problems that have been uh, brought, brought out by the uh, widespread uh, acceptance in many cases of marijuana. So that's on Wednesday, on Thursday, we're gonna be visited uh, uh, again by a um, guest, uh, guest from WHO to talk about an initiative they have for journalists during pe the pandemic. And then on Friday, we're gonna talk about polls, 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 and about politics. Uh, it looks like we're gonna have to be doing this show right through the election. We haven't uh, made any plans, but that's what we think. So we're gonna uh, do a lot of political coverage because the crisis we see in this country is in part political and caused by rotten political leadership on multiple uh, uh, on multiple levels, as you know, at the federal level, gubernatorial level, and so forth. So we'll talk about all of that. Please join us uh, this week. Please email me, sri at sri.net. We'd love to talk to you about this. And we would love to also show you this very easy to use uh, WhatsApp code so that it's not another group. It's not a WhatsApp group. It's just a light touch to know when I'm live on uh, you know, you'll get a uh, you'll get an alert whenever I'm live. So just hold up your phone, and if you if you don't know how to use this, just email me sri at sri net, and I'd love to tell you. Before we go, we're going to do something that Kimberly Crenshaw asked me to do. Kimberly is the law school professor at Columbia who coined the term intersectionality, and she asked she was asked what can we do to uh, to be allies of the African American community, and she said say their name. So we're going to do that, just that right now. And please join me as we do this. We're looking at this incredible painting by Titus Kaffer on the cover of Time magazine. On the right is Larsenia Floyd with her young son, then George Floyd. She would be, she would die two years almost to the day that he was, uh, that he would be killed in Minneapolis. They're both buried now in Houston. So let us say their names. Trayvon Martin, Yvette Smith, Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Laquan McDonald, Tanisha Anderson, Akai Gurley, Tamir Rice, Jerame Reed, Natasha McKenna, Eric Harris, Walter Scott, Freddie Gray, William Chapman, Sandra Bland, Darius Stewart, Samuel DuBose, Janet Wilson, Callan Rockmore, Alton Sterling, Philando Castile, Joseph Mann, Terence Crutcher, Chad Robertson, Jordan Edwards, Aaron Bailey, Stefan Clark, Danny Ray Thomas, Anton Antoine Rose, Botham Jean, Tatiana Jefferson, Michael Dean, Ahmad Arbery, Brianna Taylor, and George Floyd. These are the names on the cover of Time Magazine, but that list goes much, much longer. 
and goes all the way to Emmett Till and further and further and further back. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for supporting us. We're so grateful to you. We're, as always, we're very grateful to our sponsors for supporting us, including Muckrack Academy for giving us the resources to make fundamentals of social media for journalists and everyone. Free certification course now available, mrac.co slash social. 4,000 people have taken that course, mrac.co slash social. We're also grateful to nonbelievable.com. Divinely delicious cookies on a mission, 20% off with the code SREE. 20% off with SREE. Support these cookies on a mission and support the show by buying yourself a box of cookies, 20% off with the code SREE. We are so grateful to all of you. We want to thank our friends at She's On Call. Hi. I'm Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar. I'm an ear, nose, and throat surgeon in New York City and New Jersey. And I'm Dr. Marina Kurian. I'm a general surgeon in New York City area. We'd like to introduce you to our new show, She's On Call. We air live on social media platforms from 11 a.m. to noon every Sunday, Eastern Time. We discuss the medical topics of the week. We have two great guests, experts in their field that help us analyze and look at some of the topical issues of healthcare. And we are on 11 to 12, so please join us. We love to answer your questions, so please share and watch and send us your questions and comments. See you Sundays at 11. So check them out. She's on call on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. And finally, Please join us for Little Steven's Roadshow, co-hosted by Drew Carey. You know Little you know, Lil Steven, Stevie Van Zandt, from The Sopranos, E Street Band, Lillehammer, and you know Drew Carey from The Price is Right, and at Drew from TV. And they have a great lineup of conversations this week. On Thursday, August 6th, 8 p.m. Eastern, Alice Cooper, Wayne Kramer, Martha Reeves, Nick Speed, you don't want to miss this. Join us by going to teachrock.org slash roadshow, teachrock.org slash roadshow. And I want to read just the last few comments. So many of them keep coming in after uh, so many comments here. Mark says, I need to put you in touch with Jeff Eichen. He has been decriminal. He's about decriminalizing marijuana. He might be a good other guest for the show tomorrow. He too is on IBM TV. This is a topic we can certainly revisit. Rich says, Thank you again, Sri, for another fascinating and important show. Thank you very much. Thank you for this show, says Apollo. Thank you for watching. Thank you for your support. I am so grateful. We're always looking for ideas for people who can join us as guests, speakers, uh, theme ideas, topics, and sponsors. So please join us. Collaborators, we'd love to work with you, explore some new ideas. Please do get in touch. And thanks very much, everybody. Bye.